Well, hello there, folks. Uh, this is Joe Quilter, History 17 Bravo, looking at the Spanish-American War today about opening borders, I suppose. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about some uh, what we call real-world deliverables, because the Spanish-American War is one of those foundational things in history that historians can point to and say it started here. It's a watershed moment. So today in the world, uh, the United States finds itself in Afghanistan. It has been there since October of 2001. Uh, but many people don't know that we've also been in the Philippines since January of 2002. There is a pretty good insurgency in the southern islands of the Philippines. Many of them supported uh, insurgency supported by Al Qaeda or Al Qaeda, however you want to pronounce it. And so that's one of the reasons why we're there. Some of you may have a military member that is part of special ops in the Philippines right now. We've been invited by the Philippine government to help them find these terrorist cells of, of Al Qaeda in the southern islands of the Philippines. But we've also been off the coast of Somalia since. October of 2002, fighting pirates. I was there last year, teaching aboard two U.S. Navy ships, two cruisers, the USS Philippine Sea and the USS Anzio. Yeah. We've been in Northwest Pakistan since, well, March of 2004 much to the annoyance of Pakistan. But, in our country's interest, we felt that there were terrorist cells, continue to be terrorist cells, and that's possibly where the ex Bin Laden was hiding. Sure enough, uh, and we've been in believe it or not, Yemen, since January of 2010. So we're a, a lot of places. And these are just active battles. This doesn't count the number of countries we currently have bases in. And there's about 102 countries around the world that have U.S. flags flying within them in some shape or form militarily. We're everywhere. But how do we get there? Why are we in these places? And most of that, we can take a look at the Turner thesis, or this lecture is going to help us figure out how we you know, obtain that. Uh, the Turner thesis in 1893 declared that the American frontier was closed. We talked about this last week, that the frontier has always defined Americans. But has the frontier ever closed? And if you take a look here at some pictures of Admiral Perry, superhero from the War of 1812, now an old man in 1853, trying to force Japan to accept United States trade. At the barrel of a gun. So the frontier, even before the Civil War, has been expanding overseas. We're looking overseas to broaden U.S. trade. U.S. influence, U.S. something. So let's take a look at this a little closer. There's precedent and legacy in the Spanish-American War. The Spanish-American War signals that the United States is going to begin the process of empire building. We are going to become an imperialistic power. And I can say that with a straight face without any angst whatsoever that I'm incorrect because as we were getting ready for the Spanish-American War and you can read this I believe in your textbook 
there is a huge contingent of people who are joining forces to create something called the Anti-Imperialist League. And not just a few people, some very notable human beings. Mark Twain is going to be part of that anti-imperialistic league. As is, of all people, Andrew Carnegie. Interesting. In We have Carnegie, who had retired by 1898, but there are U.S. corporate interest, such as the National Association of Manufacturers, which formed in the year 1895 in the midst of a depression, demanding that the United States government do a better job in opening markets overseas. For what purpose? To bring jobs to America, to sell our products. To build a corporate empire? Maybe? We know that when we take a look at the Spanish-American War, our first attempt, very successful, that there is a precedent that is created. So we have afterwards succeeding presidents that then point to the Spanish-American War and say on the basis of the Spanish-American War we as Americans can therefore go forward in other places around the world. So you will see Teddy Roosevelt go into Panama to build a canal to get it done. It didn't matter that the country at that time, Nicaragua, didn't want to deal with the United States. So Roosevelt went down there took one of the little counties or states within Nicaragua and said, you guys want to be independent, right? Your own country? Uh, sure. Well, here's some money. Here's some arms. Here's U.S. Marines. You uh, invite us in when you declare your independence and we'll make sure we build a canal. That's what happened. William Howard Taft went further into Central America, even further south, into Honduras, El Salvador, Wilson took it closer to home. Before World War I, Wilson was chasing some people around in Mexico. The U.S. Army was in Mexico under the Woodrow administration. General Pershing making sure that United States interest was being upheld and pointing to the Spanish-American War saying it came out okay there. It should come out okay here. We have Eisenhower who warns the United States as he's leaving the presidency, beware of the military-industrial complex, in other words, companies that are building weapons of war, might have too much power and influence over policymakers in the United States. Yet, at the same time, Eisenhower, in the year 1953, you're going to figure this out when we get there, was one of the first presidents to use the CIA to stage coups around the world. And one of the first countries we overthrew was Iran. And then we wonder why they don't like us. We have uh, Ronald Reagan, who, pointing to the Spanish-American War and U.S. interest, invaded countries like Lebanon, Grenada. And then we can go on to Bush 1, went into Panama again. Bush 2, who used a policy of preemptive strikes. We don't need a reason. We can do whatever we want. We're America. And on that basis, we went into Iraq looking for the mythical weapons of mass destruction, which we never found. So, when we look at the Spanish-American War, we are looking at a huge shift in America, globally, around the world. We have a new swagger, a new attitude. We take it to the streets. 
sort of. Let's talk about Spain and its colony Cuba. There it is, right below Florida, about 98 miles or so. Spain had a problem with Cuba. In 1868, the Cubans uh, wanted to be, well, independent. And that was squashed, but in 1895, the Cuban people again fought for their independence. And this is nothing new. Mexico found its independence in 1821, and then uh, uh, Simon Bolivar down in uh, South America um, also sought independence. And uh, countries throughout South America had been finding slowly, breaking away from Spain, declaring its independence, modeling itself after the United States, at least constitutionally. And so Cuba wants the same thing. So the Cuban rebels come to the United States asking two presidents, Grover Cleveland, he's the one over there on the left, and William McKinley over there on the right, to help. But both of them refused to assist the Cuban revolutionaries who were seeking independence from Spain. Why? Why? Well, there's two official reasons. One is money. Wars cost money. It does. If you don't raise taxes to pay for the war, you end up in a deficit. As Iraq and Afghanistan demonstrated. You also have a history of the United States being a colony. The United States does not want to colonize officially. We won't do it. We were a former colony ourselves and we didn't like the experience. We don't want to be imperialistic. According to the two presidents, according to the Anti-Imperialistic League, and we don't want to raise taxes to pay for any wars. These are the two official reasons why the United States in 1895, anyway, does not pressure Spain in any way. Staying out of the fray. What happens in Cuba stays in Cuba. Right? So, what then moved the United States to actually intervene? Well, there's two things. One, those clever Cuban revolutionaries, as you see here, uh, to the right. Um, they did something rather clever. We're going to talk about it in, 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 a, in a second. And then we're going to talk about yellow journalism. Something that happened in the United States. So we got two places that are going to domestically and overseas are going to move the United States to intervene. So what did those clever revolutionaries do? Well, those clever revolutionaries decided that it would be a good idea to attack United States sugar plantations and their houses. You know those companies, CNH, had extensive sugar plantations in Cuba, hired hundreds of thousands of Cubans to help them process sugar. Suddenly, they're under attack. Cuban revolutionaries, Cuban rebels, are attacking United States property. They're owned by CNH in Cuba, but an American corporation owns them. And telephones were invented by that. So you had the CEO of CNH and other sugar companies picking up the phone, calling their congressman, hey, my sugar plantations down south are being burned to the ground. You need to do something. And for that, we're going to turn to yellow journalism because we have on the left Joseph Pulitzer, Yes, the Pulitzer Prize is named after that guy. He owned a newspaper called the New York World. It was an established newspaper. It had been around for a long, 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 long time. He was the predominant market shareholder in the city of New York, which in 1898 had a couple of million people living in it. It was a huge city. still is. Over on the right, we have a different guy. His name is William Randolph Hearst. And he 
had a new newspaper that he wanted to start up in 1895 called the New York Morning Journal. And these two are going to compete, empty their pockets, use whatever marketing tools they can to sell newspapers in New York, the biggest news market in the United States. And they do it with fantastic headlines. Both newspapers are going to attack General Valeriano Valer, a.k.a. the Butcher. Because Valer was frustrated. He could not separate the rebels from the civilians, so he creates these concentration camps, and he moves around 300,000 people throughout Cuba, putting them in concentration camps, and then consequently starving them into submission. And many of them die. 200,000. Stories coming from Cuba, and New York City has a sizable, at this time, Cuban population, and yes, this is before Ricky Ricardo, so the newspapers go crazy with this news coming out of Cuba, that the Spanish general, Valeriano Whaler, also known as the Butcher, is treating the Cuban people horribly. Headlines are going to sell newspapers. Totally. In 1895, the Morning Journal, when it first started, 30,000 papers in, in the entire year. Not a lot. Two years later, they're selling 400,000 papers. By 1898, over a million papers are being sold, which is amazing since the city is 2 million. That means just about every adult in the state of New York buys a newspaper. It's incredible the amount of sales in this quickly time. And how do they do it? Through headlines. Headlines such as what? Here we go. More fantastic, the better. Butcher Whaler eats Cuban child. Now I know it sounds like Fox News. Because it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. Just as long as it's entertaining. So we get these fantastic headlines, you know. And I, I can see these old women sitting alone on the Lower East Side. Oh, my. Butcher Whale is eating Cuban children. I'm going to call my congressman. That's not right. we got to do something. As violence broke out in Havana... McKinley has to do something. He feels pressure. He's going to send in uh, the USS Maine because old ladies sitting in the lower boroughs of New York City are calling their congressmen. We have U.S. corporations like the CNH uh, Sugar Company uh, picking up the phone, calling their senators and congressmen. You have uh, the National Association of Manufacturers uh, demanding that the United States open doors overseas. Uh, so McKinley is feeling the pressure. He's a Republican in Texas. He's got to do something. Let's see what we got around here. Oh, we, have this, we have this battleship. I don't know. I'll send the USS Maine into the harbor outside of Havana. We'll just park it there. Kind of a signal to Spain that uh, we're checking you out. But of course, on February 15th, 1898, the morning thereof, the USS Maine explodes. Over 300 sailors will die. Well, since competition for newspapers are so fierce, facts be damned, right? Newspapers use yellow journalism to draw conclusions and sell. Sell, sell, sell. And so we have an investigation beginning, not concluding, but of course yellow journalism concludes that it was Spain that blew up the USS Maine. So here is one of the political cartoons that comes out from the New York Morning Journal showing a very brutish, almost monstrous, ape-like looking Spain with a knife dipped in American blood, blood dripping on a tombstone, Maine sailors murdered by Spain. The investigation isn't even close to being complete. 
going to take years to figure out what happened. The newspapers are not going to are not going to wait. The news media wait. They accuse Spain. And by and large, people who read the newspapers, who read political cartoons like this, are convinced that Spain had their hand complicitly in the destruction and the death of all these sailors. The question is, is war inevitable at this point in time? We got yellow journalism, but we also have the lore of other Spanish possessions other than just Cuba. Other Spanish possessions such as Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines. There's business pressure from the National Association of Manufacturers. By April 11, 1898, the Spanish War began. Our forces invade Cuba to assist the Cuban rebels in overthrowing Spain. Spain will declare war on the United States promptly. But by August 12, 1898, the war is over. That's quick. Do you wish all wars were like this? What? I just woke up. Yes, it's over. Ah. April, May, June, July, August. Like four months. April, May, June, July. Yeah. That's a quick war. So what do you do with the spoils? Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. It's August 12th, the summer of 1898. People want to know. Um, Spain is, is willing to give us this stuff? Yes. Should we take it? I mean, it's a valid question considering that the United States, okay, they've taken land from Native Americans. Okay, they took land from Mexico. Okay, we tried to take land from Canada. So what do we do with these things? This is the question in 1898. And so let's talk about business pressure, about what to do with this. So over to the right is a guy by the name of Charles Denby. And in fact, uh, one of the primary documents that you have for this week is written by Charles Denby on the question of what to do with some of these territories, and in particular on the territory of the Philippines. And it came out in Forum Magazine, which was a pretty popular magazine back in 1898. I think it's still around, but radically different than what it used to be. Um, and he wrote an article in the November 1898 issue with the title, Shall We Keep the Philippines? And so let's talk about Denby's articles. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit. Now, normally I would not do this. Normally, I would not read segments of the article to you in a lecture. Normally. But this is such an interesting article that I cannot help, so forgive me, as I do it. Okay, so here's part of Denby's article. First, one of the quotes right from the top, Dewey's victory has changed our attitude before the world. And Dewey was an admiral, and he had a huge victory in Manila Bay, in the Philippines. Decimated the Spanish fleet. And Spain is a superpower still at this time, albeit a fading superpower. So what our Navy did to their Navy, people are going, who? Oh, that's amazing. So... He can say this with a straight face. Dewey's victory has changed our attitude before the world. The world sees the United States totally differently. We have a great commerce to take care of. We have to compete with the commercial nations of the world in far distant markets. Commerce, not politics, is king. The manufacturer and the merchant dictate to diplomacy and control elections. Wow. Nothing like honesty. I, I keep I can't help but think of our election cycle today when I read this. Further in Denby's articles, the whole world sees in China a splendid market for our native products. Our timber, our locomotives, our rails, our coal, our oil, our sheetings, our mining plants, and numberless other articles. China is going to be the place where we send American products, had he only known. 
Further in the article, he says that the Philippines are a foothold for us in the Far East. Their possession gives us standing and influence. In other words, we need the Philippines as a foothold in the Far East because the Philippines will supply us with uh, a, a base for our ships, coaling stations, refueling, um, secours or other products such as milk and vegetables and meat and chickens and all the things that you need to resupply a ship. And when we possess it, we get standing in the world. We get to influence the world because we are owning another country. If we don't own another country, we don't have standing and influence, is basically Charles Denby's argument. Further, there is perhaps no such thing as a manifest destiny, but there is evident fitness in the happening of events. And it, it, this reminds me of last week when we were talking about uh, survival of the fittest. So we have evident fitness in the happening of events. We are coming to our own. We are stretching out our hands for what nature meant should be ours. Providence? Maybe. Right? It's God's gift to us. We are after markets, and along with these markets will go our beneficent institutions, and humanity will bless us. Sounds a lot like Josiah Strong from the document last week. Yes, let's spread democracy around the world, even if it's at the barrel of a gun. So I just have one question. Who the heck is Charles Denby? I was wondering if anybody out there thought of this question. Now, this is part of the historical inquiry process, right? You read a document, you should be raising questions as you're reading. Constant questions, constant questions, constant questions. So this is the question I had that kept popping up. I said, who is this guy? So I want to figure out who Charles Denby is. How do I do that? eBay. What? Yes. Do you know historians use eBay? It's true. I have a historical figure like that guy, Charles Denby. I want to know who he is. Maybe there's some paraphernalia associated with that name that's being sold on eBay. So I go to eBay and I will type in this category, antiques. I'm going to search antiques for the term uh, Charles Denby and I get 39 results found for Charles Denby. Ooh, I'm excited. This is cool. Let's see what those results are. Well, two of those results are Antique Charles Denby and Lefendrich Five Cent Cigars Advertising Cigar Box Tool. And I can get it in 14 days. Well, I can get it expedited. I can return it in 14 days. Oh, look at that. Charles Denby Cigar Box. Really? Hmm. Interesting. See, this was such a short war, four months. Splendid little war, said Theodore Roosevelt. And it's Charles Denby. Here he's right there. He's on a cigar box. A cigar box. Cuba has a lot of... Um, what is it? What does Cuba have a lot of? Tobacco. Cuba has a lot of tobacco. Not only that, but the best tobacco in the world. Hmm. So if I own a company that makes cigars... Ooh, okay, now these, these couple of your neurons in your brain are clicking, I hope. Um, and China in 1898 has a lot of hmm, oh people. So yeah, here we have this book, New China and Her People. By the way, this is on eBay as well. China and Her People, Volume Two, written by Charles 
done, be done, be served for the United States of America as the minister to China and those are the years 1885 to 1898 he spoke fluent Mandarin he knows China inside and out if there's anybody who knows China inside and out it's Charles Denby and he knows they like to smoke cigars and he owns a cigar company and he now has access to the best tobacco in the world and oh yes by the way Charles Denby invented the baseball card he did the first baseball cards were printed and then put and inserted into Charles Denby cigar boxes so you didn't just buy Charles Denby cigars for the cigars you opened the box to get your baseball card man was a wizard at business wasn't he yes he owned a cigar company yes he um, had a position in the Spanish American War one where he could gain Cuban tobacco make the world's greatest cigars put them on ships and head them towards China and along the way you stop in the Philippines well we have to have the Philippines to get to China is Denby's argument Ladies and gentlemen, this is called vested self-interest. As to what it is. Well, that's it for now. If you need any more help, just an email away.